like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, What is Machine Learning Anyway? My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, uh, we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides uh, and recording will be posted on Techopedia, uh, the website, within a few days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Michael Weir. Michael is currently working with Quantarian Solutions, Inc. as a senior technical advisor and a subject matter expert for CSIAC. In addition, he's also working with the Griffiths Institute as the developer and facilitator for the uh, AFRL-sponsored Machine Learning Boot Camp. And that's a multi-month immersion program for AFRL engineers. Uh, Mr. Weir previously served uh, as the director of the CSIAC, and prior to that, he was the chief of communications and information systems at the Eastern Air Defense Sector, EADS, here in Rome, New York. Uh, EADS is one of two NORAD NORTHCOM air defense sectors in uh, CONUS. And uh, he was responsible for setting up and maintaining the sector's cyber posture both during and after 9-11 and uh, evolving the data, communication, sensing integration capability through the following decade. Uh, I'll now turn the presentation over to Mr. Ware. Good afternoon, Michael. The floor is now yours. Well, hi. Good afternoon, folks. It's nice to be here and, and talking a little bit about machine learning. I'd also like to thank DTIC for making this opportunity to spread hopefully some good news and good words about machine learning a little wider because it is quite a popular topic. And what I hope to do today is give people a little bit more of a conceptual idea of what's behind the hood, under the hood, behind the scenes with machine learning to help you understand what it's actually capable of doing and kind of the high points and the low points. So the way that I want to do that is to step through a set of slides, kind of give you a sense of what machine learning is really about, kind of what it is and what it isn't, to give you a flavor of what things are possible and what things are just silly. To show you a couple of diagrams about what machine learning looks like as a workflow, if you're actually going to be productive uh, in a world where machine learning works, that what you would need to do to implement it effectively. Then the three representative scenarios, essentially the core three slides in the presentation, kind of highlight the primary and foundational methods for looking at data and deciding what's in there anyway. And there'll be three types of foundationally neural networks that I talk about to give you a sense of what that actually is, is doing under the hood. After that, provide some examples of good and bad uses. In the presentation, there'll be some links and some other kind of things that you could uh, exercise to find out more information. We won't be following those links in this brief, but they're open source, they're good source material and interesting information to help you get a little bit further about seeing what's possible and also the bad things that are possible and have happened. Finally, to provide some ideas for how to think about machine learning. If you're, if you're on the side of trying to figure out whether or not to do it, or if you're on the side of trying to figure out how to do it well, what it means to do it well, the last slide kind of summarizes essentially all of the stuff that I had to skip to get through the, uh, this 20-slide this, uh, set to get to the point of saying, here's all the other things that you should be pondering in addition to these basic concepts, because there, it, it is a much wider conversation than just the technical aspect. And I'm trying to focus on the technical aspect for this particular brief. 
So as we move on to the next slide, I also enjoy uh, questions, so please, please feel free. Naturally, to start out, uh, I've shown this to several different organizations, uh, colleges, and, and uh, other engineering organizations. And I like to start out with a quiz just to give you a sense of how you think about it internally before we get through the brief so you can reflect afterwards and see if there's a difference in the way that your posture you're postured to consider machine learning. It's a full question, and it's just a really quick way to say, this is what I currently think, and then maybe after it's over to look back and see if this makes sense to you. So the first is just, there's three pictures. So if you had to consider for yourself, gee, I'm thinking about machine learning. I think it kind of works like a human brain. That's the A selection. The B selection is, uh, it's, it's just magic. It just happens. It's, it's astounding. And the C selection is what's called a magic eight ball. And uh, my generation, we grew up with these things. So, but I found that even uh, university students at uh, sophomore and junior levels are, are aware of what it is. If you shake it up and you ask a question while you're shaking it, and it's a little multi-sided uh, uh, cubic inside the ball that floats to the top and shows you yes, no, maybe, and you ask it things like, will I be married someday? It was a, a kid's toy. But which of those three, if you thought to yourself, when I think machine learning, one of those three pictures is the one that I would closely associate. And the, the, the I, fortunate or unfortunate, uh, it's more like the magic eight ball. Because if it's not on the cube to begin with, it's not going to find it. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why that's true. And a couple of slides about what it is and what it isn't will highlight why A and B are popular but not accurate. The second question, which of the following is the truest statement? Is it is it always better to have more data? That's the popular statement these days is give me more data, need more data, need more data. But is that is that the truest statement? Is it always better to have more data? Is it always better to have the smallest amount of good data to solve your problem? Or it kind of depends. And the answer for that one is kind of the one that most people would, uh, would guess on a multiple guess program. It depends because the amount of data you need depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And that's one of those creativity aspects of machine learning that we'll talk about a little bit that you can have a huge amount of data if you have a little problem you really don't need that much and you're going to be you know using a, a chainsaw to, to trim the to, to trim the grass around a tree the true or false is just uh, observational to see how aware you are i personally don't use machine learning i've actually got a pretty good reaction rate when i when i keep score in a in a physical audience group i ask people do you personally use ml and pretty much all of them uh, have said, oh, yes, I do. This is a false question because everybody uses ML. And, and that's the true statement. It's been around for a while. It is everywhere. And if you use the Internet, you cannot not use machine learning. And the final question is just an observational question to, to see what, what your experience base is. And 50s, 70s, 90s, or 2000s, when was it actually like let loose on the world in a production environment to actually help make some decisions about data. And the answer to that one is kind of late 80s, 1990s. That's when things like uh, credit assignment and scores and, and, and recommendation, and those kinds of things started to come into the field. Those were the, the fledgling exemplars of using machine learning, and it has been just the last... Uh, little short of a decade. It's been just astounding where it's gone. But that's that's just, just a, a quiz to start. Uh, if I show this in a university setting and pop up the first slide and says first a quiz, it gets, a, it gets an interesting reaction. So what is it? Google things about four days ago, there are 367,000 hits, round numbers. So there's 400,000-ish website locations that Google says has something to say about what is machine learning. Even if 1% of those have some content of value. That's still about kind of 4,000 possible sources that we'll describe to you and happy to describe to you what it is. Uh, very difficult to determine. Industry, several years ago, said, oh, there's four types. 
academia changes over time, as it, as it should, as things change. But you can get numbers, three, four, five, six, seven, of different types. Now, the reason there's a lot of different views is because machine learning is not a single thing. It's a sequence of events that have to do with uh, scientific and non-scientific aspects of trying to figure out what is there in the data and how can I tease it out. More recently, some of the different views are because the, since it is popular, uh, there are folks that say, I want to become famous and make my own algorithm and name it, when under the hood, it's a much simpler type with a little tweak. But gosh, if I get my name and that algorithm, that's wonderful. So it kind of confuses things because the foundations are pretty straightforward. We're going to stick with the, some of the basic general consensus ideas. I'm going to talk about neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and recurrent neural networks because they represent a foundational family of things that allow you to see under the hood and kind of understand what's going on. And we're going to assume that we have not just the data that represents things that have happened in the past because that's where data comes from in the past, but that we also have the answers to what that data represents. In other words, if we're doing a credit assignment problem, we not only have the data about all of the applicants, we also have the results of whether or not they were a good or a bad risk so that we can use supervised learning to help the network figure out, well, you figured it was a good credit risk. The right answer is it wasn't, so we're going to do something about it because that's, that's kind of the machinery under the hood for the, just the foundational ideas of how it works. And we'll get into a little more detail. Two slides, what it is and what it isn't. It is a subset of artificial intelligence. That's kind of generally accepted. But it's a narrow perspective. It does a specific thing very well. And people are beginning to use the term artificial narrow intelligence for machine learning and all those the family underneath that. Deep learning and the variants thereof are subsets of machine learning, which does a specific thing with data. What it does is it, it takes in data, numbers, and finds patterns. That's it. That's the one sentence summary of what machine learning is. It's a thing that takes in data and finds patterns. And it hands you back. If you ask it what something is and it can find a pattern, it will tell you the number that that pattern represents doesn't know what it's doing, it's just messing with numbers. It's made up of data handlers, which are extremely important to make sure those things are correctly handled, and under the hood mathematical algorithms that are implemented in some special purpose hardware for hard problems, generally called GPUs, TPUs, sensor processing units, but essentially it's the hardware under the hood that does the math. Machine learning is software that people build, it doesn't build itself, and it's very related to data mining, statistical data mining, statistical data analysis. It's kind of where it evolved from. And sometimes you only need those specific kinds of tools and not machine learning. And we'll talk about that here in just a bit. Now what it isn't, it's not equivalent to artificial intelligence. It's a very narrow perspective on what you can do with data. It's not intelligent. It's artificial, it's not intelligent, it does what you tell it to do foundationally. And it doesn't understand things like you do. This is an important point for folks that want to kind of understand it is they try to relate it to personal experience, which is a normal thing, people should do that. But you can't really do that because it doesn't see, it doesn't hear, it doesn't read, it uses math to transform the data it is handed and mangle it around to find patterns in all those numbers, and it will match those numbers with other numbers to give you an answer, which is also a number. You just have to tell it what that number represents. And then when it gives you the number, you can know what it represents. It doesn't know when it's wrong. That's the biggest problem for me with machine learning is that if you're not careful, it will give you a wrong answer with high confidence. And one of the, the two exemplars from a paper from a couple of years ago that, that, that highlight that, and there are much more contemporary examples of kind of things with autonomous driving. But for these, these are very clear things that's easy for people to understand that this, this, this particular picture here 
was determined by a, a reasonably good algorithm for two years ago that 99% probability that is a manhole cover. And additionally, uh, in another instance, that this, which is an exemplar of a handwritten digit on an algorithm that had been uh, uh, trained on the NIST handwritten data set, which is a popular data set for, for popular machine learning aficionados, says, no, that's a two. As a person, as a human, you can see that both of those are just silly. But to the machine learning algorithm, you gave it data, it found the pattern, and it handed back the number that represented the pattern that it decided was correct, and that number represented a tree, category of tree, or a category of manhole cover, uh, when in fact it wasn't. And that's one of the things, just ideal wise, machine learning does incredible things that is that, that people are just not capable of doing. On the opposite side, people can do amazing things that machine learning just can't handle. And that's part of the reason for some of the, the, the discussions about what do you make autonomous, what do you make assistive, and, and the current best practice is machine learning should be used in an assistive fashion because that's really what it's good for right now. In practice, the, to get to the end of deploying something, there's a there's a there's a small piece. If you're on your cell phone uh, and you're using some application that automatically takes a picture when you smile, that's that's the deployment part of it. There's a little bit of machine learning in there that knows just enough about a face, just enough to recognize eyes, nose, mouth, smile, period. And it will flash when it sees it, and it will not be there when it doesn't see it. That's the deployment part of it. The interesting part of it that we're going to spend some time talking about is the learning. How do you get to the point that you can just deploy something that very simply and with a low uh, computational level can find out what a smile is? That's the result of doing all of the learning up front, which is really the build it in the hard phase, or the, the hard phase. So a starting position. You would like to know, well, all right, well, where should I start thinking about using this? There's kind of three basic conceptual areas that would you need to look to figure out whether you've got all three so that you could consider machine learning for a reasonable way to proceed forward. You've got to have data. Machine learning without data is not all that helpful. Whether it's existing, it's generated uh, by you or for you, you need lots of it. For real-world problems, you need a ton of data. If there's no data or minimal data, machine learning is not going to be able to help you out very much because it can't pull out of the math enough information to be helpful. The second part is as it's operating on the data, there's got to be some kind of a pattern for it to find. If there is, in fact, no pattern in the data, the machine learning will attempt to learn as hard and as long as you push the CPU and keep it running, but it won't get anywhere. Now, you don't always know definitively that there is a pattern, so the experimentation is an important part, but there has to be a, at least a heuristic idea or a concept that I'd really like to work with this and find out if there's a pattern in there. That's all in that learning thing where you do the work up front. And the, the area that people probably should be paying more attention to is the problem is likely intractable using other tools because if other tools are available, statistical data analysis, standard data mining, uh, other analytic tools that you already use, they are probably less resource intensive. The, the build up part, the learning phase can take quite a bit of resource cost wise and, and just, just work wise. If there are other methods, they're probably going to be more robust and accurate because at the at the heart of it a machine learning algorithm is a guessing game. And it will it will guess until it gets really close and you decide when it's done. So let's let's just do a, a, a couple of slides. I'm going to get through these pretty darn quickly to get to the three main slides. The a pipeline concept, you need to have an idea of how machine learning actually gets used in an applied situation. So this picture is kind of a general pipeline. You start at the upper left, 
that you got a problem to solve, you've determined you've got data, and and you go from understanding the problem to building some kind of hypothesis or set of ideas about what it might be, and then you work with the data available and come up with a model that represents the universe of things that you're going to be concerned about. You could you get to construct this uh, on paper in your head, however you want to do it, but you need to tell the algorithm that you pick, once you think about what your model is and what the data is capable of providing, then you get into the algorithm and kind of figure out, it's this sort of a problem space. I think I'm going to use this approach. Having done that, you then need to go to the second set of roundabout where you tend to spend your time. Once I've made that choice, I have to use the data to train this algorithm I need to also test it to make sure that what I do is reasonable. And then I need to validate a final step before I release it to the world in this little deployed thing that finds the smile in the picture so that when you get this machine learning algorithm out in the real world, it doesn't fail. Because there's no guarantee that the data that you are given completely represents the real world. And sometimes when you release it to the real world and it fails, it's because you didn't have enough data or you didn't do the right things with the data. And the next slide, next two slides, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. This is, you got to build up a good good idea of how to solve the problem. The first is that you got to have those three components up front, data, possible pattern, in a context that I want to use in now. Then the problem also, you need to define that. There's no substitute for domain knowledge. You can't just throw data into an algorithm and expect any kind of a real answer. A weak model, a non-representative model, will virtually always guarantee a weak machine learning capability. And, and the think first is NIST. And unfortunately, many of the commercial frameworks that want you to take the red easy button path to doing machine learning make so many assumptions that the think first part you may not be making the right choices in all the early phases, and when you push the button to make the NL do what it does, it probably is not going to help. And there's still some definition difficulties in, in, in the workflow, and I'm, I'm trying to make it clear where, where those are different. These are the four roundabouts that I talked about. A lot of creativity, grunt work, data mangling is a big piece of, of the front part. That second roundabout is potentially more frustrating, but you've got to interpret the outputs, try to figure out what happened, reflect on the model, round and round you go, and then finally get ready to deploy it. The three models. The first one is a simple neural net. And uh, the diagrams look a little bit complex, but I'm, I'm trying to get you the idea of what it actually, how three particular approaches function and why machine learning works. So the bottom line is, and you can read some of the words on the slide, that you've got some data that's input. If we use something like the credit exemplar, you've got a number of features. Time you've been here is a number. Your income is a number. The uh, credit load you currently have is a number. Uh, some other things would be a number. You feed those features into a, a, a number of nodes to store. You multiply those astoundingly, by a random weight. Each of the next layer, you take those, you add them all up, and you put them in here, and you multiply it by another number. And you do the same for this and this and this, and the numbers are all different. And then you do it again, and you do that process again, and you have, you reduce this to the final selection that you want to, which is your class output. This picture these three here suggest that what you're doing is trying to figure out one of three things. You're trying to pick one of three things, so one of those three things is going to come out. When one of those three things comes out, you check and see whether that got the right answer. You've guessed a lot of weights to make these numbers move around and figure out what comes out. Odds are you're not going to do very well. But what you're doing under the hood is you're saying, I'm going to find a way to qualify the error so I can step back through and I can correct these weights in kind of a good way so that they get better. 
Then I'm going to take the next exemplar, the next applicant data, and I'm going to feed it to, multiply it those new weights, get this output, and compare it to the answer. If it's right, I'm going to send something back that's different than if it's wrong. And this area of choosing the error, the cost, there's a lot of words for it, but essentially you're defining a way to multiply things by weights this way, generate an error signal that corrects the weights, put in another sample, and do it again. And that roundabout, that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is the difference in machine learning and an analytic solution. You're not explicitly programming it. You're telling it, I want you to put weights in, I want you to adjust them, and I want you to keep jumping through the data. And over time, it works. It shouldn't, you would think. You know, the, the, the basic mental model for people is, how does that possibly work? But it is the foundational basis. That's really what it does. And this back propagation, this feeding back, is really what made the, the change for the uh, recent state over the last five, six years of really, really successful. 2010, 2012, back propagation got, got really good so that you can do this. And this is the underlayment of, of most of the, the modern approaches, is this back propagation that allows you to correct things and then keep cycling through this to get better and better. And when you're done, when the weights stop changing, that is this corrective action, I'm getting everything right out. These weights now tell me if I put new data in, something I've never seen before, it's probably going to use those weights and give me the right output for something that it hasn't seen before. And that's the point of doing machine learning, is giving it something it hasn't seen and getting the right answer out regardless, because you trained it the right way. This is a quick summary, but I'm hoping you get some of the concepts behind it, and we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. There are two other foundational types, and there's a description I tried to make as straightforward an exemplar as I could. But essentially, if you have something like a picture, that's not necessarily a line of singular data points. It's a grid of pixel values. And by golly, I don't care what any one pixel is. I want to figure out what collections of pieces are so that I can determine something about that picture. I'm still going to calculate an answer at the end, and it's absolutely going to be wrong the first time. But when it feeds back through, I want to adjust these weights at different layers of the network. There will be a convolution layer after layer after layer. Each one of those gets a little bit more complex information from the previous layer. So that the convolutional layer, I apologize for the line there, the convolutional layer builds up these two-dimensional patterns in more complex ways. The first run-through, as it trains, it's going to get that first layer able to find lines. Then that second layer is going to be able to find how those lines operate and get curves or texture or something. And then further down, it's going to be able to determine something that might be a characteristic thing that might be an ear. And finally, towards the end, decide it's a cat. It persists relation information over spatial extent, two dimension. And the third type is the recurrent neural network. This one's hard. Anything that starts with R-E-C-U-R, recurrent, recursion, uh, it's, it's a difficult concept. The foundational idea is what you want to do is you want to keep track of things over time that have a relationship for something that happened before. And the way that's done in the neural network world is that you keep the current state of this input. This is the same input and output with a weight thing that happens that you saw in the earlier neural network. But it keeps the state inside, a value inside a state that ends up being forwarded to the next one in line, that gets manipulated to the next one in line. And it, it reduces the number of weights, but it increases the complexity of calculating them. What ends up happening is it can relate a 
a value early to a value later and decide whether there's a relationship there with these subtle adjustments of the weight. The exemplar is if you have a sentence, John and Mary both bought ice cream cones, but hers was better than his, but then he dropped it. And that it at the end, if you're not keeping a memory, you're trying to figure out does it what does it refer to? John, Mary, ice cream, flavor. Um, you have to have a way to connect over time or distance from that value to do that. That's what recurrent neural networks do. So those are the three foundational things that it do. It's all a little bit of math under the hood and just working with numbers. A lot of amazing things that can be done with it. And, and you're aware of all of the things that are coming out. It seems like machine learning is in, in most of the highlights of lots of things that are going on. It crosses all technical boundaries, all domain boundaries. Uh, weather forecasting, that's an extremely hard thing to do. But machine learning componentry added to it. You'll notice that in weather forecasting, the short-term forecasts are somewhat better than they used to be. The longer term forecast, maybe not so much. That's because some of the limitations of how much you can correlate that memory over time and make sense out of it with a recurrent kind of an approach. The ways to think of the data that comes from molecular electronic properties that you can cycle through hundreds of thousands of things quickly and make determinations about what works and doesn't and then hand back a smaller few for people to think about because people are a whole lot better at thinking deeply about smaller number of variables. Machine learning thinks very, very superficially about huge numbers of values. And if you use the system, the assistance model, then humans can effectively use machine learning but make better decisions because of it. Then there are some kind of interesting ones. The, there's, uh, if you look at the link, there's kind of an interesting, uh, a fellow said, I'm just going to have it come up with some new ice cream flavors by feeding it lots of other texts and other flavors. And it comes up with some interesting, some good, some, good, some very bad. If uh, This is not the exact video link because in a previous presentation, I saved the video and I, I just can't play it through DCS right now. But if you look up, Google Deep Dream and Grocery Store, it's, a, it's kind of a hypnotic video that you told this machine learning algorithm, go find animals in these frames of video. And when you find an animal, find more. It's kind of like reinforcing and reinforcing and reinforcing the idea that there must be animals in there somewhere. And it makes up animals. It's really quite interesting if you haven't seen it before. And then there are bad uses. And some of the things that you can do with machine learning are you could categorize as definitively not helpful to you know, the, the, the social structure and privacy and those kinds of things. So to kind of wrap it up, if you're thinking about machine learning, the good news and bad news are exactly the same. Machine learning will give you an answer. You essentially hand it data, and you are also kind of highlighting what you would suggest is a right answer, whether it's explicitly with supervised learning or implicitly with some of the more modern, modern approaches like reinforcement or other kinds of learning approaches that kind of suggest an answer and then give some variability for how it decides to do it. The true bottom line, neither you nor the algorithm really know if what it's doing is right. And Leslie Valiant several years ago wrote an article about probability, probably approximately correct, which is um, what learning really amounts to. And it's really helpful. I would recommend the paper. There's also a book. Uh, the book is a little repetitive, but the paper is actually pretty readable and helpful. The other, the other, the other recommendation, just to think about how people work, is one called uh, The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 1. And that's a really good book by George Miller from 1956 that covers the, the methods that people use to reduce the complexity of a problem to seven or less dimensions so they can operate on it. Modern problems need tons of data, and, and it needs to be reasonably good data. 
and that's a that's a real problem with some of the things that are the problems that are trying to be solved now is getting the right kind and the right size of data. A lot of popular frameworks, and I would advise you to 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 experiment with some of the web-based. Lots of people are offering uh, these web-based interactive. Kaggle has competitions. Kaggle.com, 2G's, KGGLE. Uh, all of the big folks, Microsoft, Azure, uh, uh, Google, they all have cloud platforms where you can experiment with machine learning. Excellent starts to help you exercise these things at a very easy level. But understand that doing well with machine learning really breaks down to domain knowledge and understanding the math. You can't do well at machine learning without getting into the math. And the rules of thumb that are baked into most of these frameworks, they're quite good. They're, they're the result of a decade or more of lots of people experimenting with lots of things and figuring out that, oh, the, the size of the, the number of nodes you want in a particular layer in this particular instance is kind of 64 to 128. And the learning rate is probably 0.1. And there are the rules of thumb that are baked in. But if you don't understand what you're doing, it's still easy to get a wrong answer. So here's what we didn't talk about. The tremendous amount of things that you can run into that would be, uh, that are concerning, that you should kind of concern yourself with. Security, policy, privacy, those are all big discussions. Trending techniques. We didn't talk about any of these techniques, but there's some really, uh, the, the really inverse reinforcement learning, some geometric methods where you're trying to extend beyond the three bases that I talked about were essentially a pointwise representation of the data in the, in the credit exemplar, uh, a linear fine distance relationship with the recurrent kind of network, or a, a two-dimensional spatial extent with convolutional networks. Now, the obvious extension of that is to try to go to some higher dimensions or pull in some other aspects of information so that you can do a better job. And lots of people are working on that. It's, it's kind of exciting. It will be the next big thing after machine learning. Data handling is huge. 80% of the job by lots of folks that really get to do the grunt work, they say 80% of it is messing with the data, finding it, cleaning it, making sure it's appropriate, removing bias. Another big thing, ethics and bias. If if you're if you if you're unaware, there there is a. If I can get this to draw the line, there it is. Uh, DoD uh, Mark Esper on Monday officially put out the ethics principle ethical principles for artificial intelligence to the to the community. It's readable. Uh, it's it's a good it's a very good start. They've been working on it for for almost a year and a half now and put it out there. We didn't talk about what's hot right now, explainable AI, but just dump data in, we'll handle it for you. There are all kinds of things that people are attempting. And they're, they're all down the topic six, but, but for right now, I'm, I, I just wanted to summarize that. And I would thank you for your attention. And um, I would ask for, if you got questions, because this should be, a, I'm hoping to get some feedback. What do you all think? Steve, yeah, what so do you Yes. So, if, uh, like Michael said, if uh, folks have questions, uh, if you've been wondering about uh, machine learning and what it is, what it can do, if you've if you've got a particular question, uh, take advantage and uh, bounce it off Michael. But uh, so so first of all, Michael, I think I appreciate the I appreciate the presentation in um, you know trying to help us understand it. You know when you uh, you know watch. You know, watch the news, read articles. Uh, you know, it, it, machine learning can be anything from a panacea to a Pandora's box. You know, it's either going to cure everything, you know, it's going to fix everything, or or it's going to be the, uh, you know, lead to the end of the world as as we know it. So, <laughs> I, I I guess I guess it's probably somewhere in the in the middle. You know, it's not either one of those extremes. So. Well, and, and it wouldn't be machine learning that takes us there. That that would be something more like generalized artificial intelligence, where they decide to take over. But machine learning is is far more refined than that. Even even if you uh, if you're assigning machine learning, uh, for example, if you're talking about some autonomous operation, where machine learning is the thing that is used to provide 
the you know to read the data coming in in the sensors and make choices on that data. Autonomy doesn't mean freedom of action. Autonomy means, for machine learning in particular, that it will do the thing that you asked it to do. You've just given it boundaries in which to do that action. So the operation for machine learning is applied to things that are more autonomous than not, is that you have to prescribe those boundaries more carefully. But it isn't Autonomy as a word does not necessarily mean freedom of action. Autonomy means that within some bounds, you're, you're still fulfilling a policy or a desire or a solution to a problem that has been posed with some bounds. And that's the art of it, is trying to find out what needs to be autonomous and what needs to be handed back for assistive operations. And that's the, like I said, that's a huge area, but that's, that's somewhere that we could go with a whole other discussion. Okay. Okay. Thanks for thanks for that uh, explanation. So, sure. so I, I guess I guess another I guess another thing you know, so AI machine learning has been around for quite a while, but it seemed in the you know last decade that you know it really began to take off. It really, you know, we really started to see some advances. And so I guess I'm kind of curious. Um, was was there anything in particular, you know, that one thing in particular? Was there a combination of things? Was it, you know, uh, just advances in the R&D, more money getting, you know, pumped into the well, uh, arena? Uh, historically, the artificial intelligence in general has kind of had the, you know, the, the roller coaster ride way up high and way down low and way up high and way down low, and we're kind of approaching another high. Uh, but the, the thing that made that ascent possible is kind of a, about a decade old or so when, when folks in particular, one of, the, one of the particular folks was Jeff Hinton from uh, in a Canadian machine learning expert, wonderful fellow, incredibly intelligent, kind of figured out reasonable ways to make the back propagation that is on this particular thing, this, this thing that says, I want you to make things better on this reverse path by subtly adjusting the weights so the next time through it gets better. And that, that, that I guess you could call solving it the back propagation problem. Back propagation wasn't new for this arena, but it wasn't, I, I would say, well formed. 2010, 2012, a couple of competitions. Uh, there were a couple of algorithms in particular for text handling that ended up just blowing things out of the water with incredible results compared to previous competitions and previous attempts. And it was that, that was one of the, you know, if you wanted to kind of prime the engine with a little bit of kerosene or gasoline to start it up, that's what started it up going. And then uh, it's kind of been relying on that. And as a matter of fact, in 2017, uh, at another conference, Jeff Hinton was the one that also said, you know, this is getting kind of tired, guys. We've got to figure out what's next. And uh, referencing the, the, this reliance on this forward, backward propagating thing that, that had some limits. And that's uh, folks have been thinking about that over the last few years and they're, they're finding some interesting and exciting directions. But from the production standpoint, the things that you see in the real world that are production level are, are still foundationally this improved method for learning in a good way that you have better guarantees and essentially a better learning rate so that the answers are much closer to correct. No guarantees for absolutely correct. The probably approximately correct comes into play, but they are they're wonderful. They're quite good. They're calculable given the, the, the developments in uh, graphics processing unit, tensor processing units, and a couple of new concepts are coming up. So the hardware is better, lots more data, and algorithmically the back propagation was the thing that kind of got it kicked off. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, you, yeah, I, you did touch on it. You had you had a couple uh, pictures early on. So I guess. You know, so you know, machine learning is going to give you an answer, you know, whether it's right or not. Oh. So, uh, you, you know, so that I mean, I guess that is a question. You know, the explainable AI, you know, the trust, you know, how much trust. So, you know, you've seen the examples, um, 
you know, I've seen examples where, you know, somebody, it's a, a stop sign, and they just put, you know, a little piece of tape, you know, a little piece of black tape on it, not not much, you know, just, but it's 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 enough to, you know, have have the machine in, instead of interpreting interpreting it as a stop sign, you know, maybe it maybe it says, well, the, the speed limit here is 65 miles an hour. So I guess the, the nature I, of machine learning, well, well, the the difficulty with that, and, and it's hard to trust if you if you can't reason about why it's getting the answer. And it, it's bothersome to people when they see something that's clearly wrong as a human. That's a dragonfly. That's absolutely not a manhole cover. You are so stupid. How could you possibly do that? If you look in the upper right corner, you start to see a little bit of a grid in this in this picture. Uh, you start to see some other things, and you start to think about what is it that the machine learning algorithm, its numbers and relationships between numbers, um, the exemplars where people have been able to discern what happened. There was an early exemplar several years ago of trying to figure out uh, if a picture is a horse or if a picture is not a horse, binary decision. They gathered tons of data about horses, tons of pictures about horses, and they let this machine learning algorithm loose on it, uh, too loose on it, and it came back and it had some great scores in the machine learning. They separated the data into training data and test data, did great on the test data, put it out in the real world. It was a miserable failure. And it turned out when they actually went back through and tried to figure out what math was happening and what node and what kind of things, really difficult, but they really teased it out that the highest percentage of pictures came from a particular horse farm, and that horse farm always put their farm logo in the lower right-hand corner. So if 80% of your pictures have a round logo with some letters in it in the lower right-hand corner, and your job is to tell whether or not there's a horse in that picture, the logo will get you 80% correct because the pictures that were not horses didn't have that logo. So the machine learning will find relationships that you can't comprehend because the dimensionality is too high. That's the 7 plus or minus 2. Machine learning is great at working in high dimensional spaces, but the things that it finds to build into patterns are not what you would think it would use. It will find the easiest path to get the best answer. If you're going to get 80% just by looking at the little circle in the right-hand corner, what do you care if it's a horse? It's not what the algorithm's thinking, but it's what the math is doing. Gotcha, gotcha. So once again, it kind of you know depends on the the data sets, what it sees in the data sets, and that's that's oh, how sure. it's going to make its determinations. Mm -hmm. So okay, um, so so you you know you did talk about some different uh, areas uh, you know that it's good for, it's bad for, or you know might be bad for. So there was so. I've, read read some things about you know different places um you, you know uh places like MIT Google Rice University Cambridge University using it for um machine learning to to develop software code um you know I'm just kind of curious you know what you what you think about that as a potential application um you know, and and one of those, you know, one of those entities was actually, you know, trying to find errors and modify code on the fly, which kind of, uh, I, I don't know. Once again, that kind of concerned me a little bit. But what do you, what do you think yeah. about, you know, ML for you know writing software code? Well, for writing raw code and coming up with a solution to a problem, you you have to be able to describe it in some way. So if you have people that are in fact highly competent software people that know about code and can feed it data that represents a solution path that they think is promising, but they just can't figure out how to build the algorithm or do something. I could see some paths ahead. Uh, and, and there's been some earlier work that was not machine language based, but it, it was based on uh, uh, trying to find random algorithms that got better answers than uh, analytically defined things. Can you find an ability to get an answer using machine learning? The answer is yes, you probably can. It will solve the problem that you pose if you pose it well enough. 
But the exemplar of things like generating text, if you do a chatbot, um, if you look at some of the things that have come out from the that generative world where they say, look at the text that this machine learning algorithm produced, and it looks like a completely reasonable page or page and a half of discussion about things that's incredibly coherent, and then there's a little asterisk there at the bottom that says, oh, by the way, this is a little bit cherry-picked from 100,000 results, some of which were absolute gobbledygook. Uh, so it's the consistency that would prevent it from being something like in the next few years being effectively writing its own software. It, it's the consistency and the, and the specificity of an answer when you're doing something that is software-related versus something that's a little bit more definitive that's just numbers. And it's, it's related to software languages that are, are close to a context-free grammar. Uh, so it might be easier than human language, which has context all over the place with these long-distance relationships. But uh, software code itself is logical. It's more context-free, which means there's not a relationship too much between the meanings of things, that it's very consistent itself. Uh, self-defined, de so yeah, I could I could see a potential for it, but I think that the consistency would be a question. Okay, all right. Um, so how about how about a uh, in cybersecurity? So I was reading about a um, insurance company, and they they were, said they were running like 300 uh, mach uh, machine learning models. Uh, in order to, to control the security of their information enterprise, uh, you know, so I, it said they had in, implemented about 600 different IA controls, and they kind of changed them uh, almost daily. So that was one one application they were doing, and then um, they were also using it for authorization decisions, uh, where they had a centralized uh, ML program, and it was taking into account, I think it said about 60 different attributes, you know, before they would grant somebody access to the system. So, you know, what do you think about cybersecurity as a, uh, you know, as, a, as an area for, for uh, uh I, I think it's a right area. I think, I, 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 as an opinion, and this, and this is my opinion, that, that if you're thinking about cybersecurity, that if you look at the current posture for cybersecurity, the point of time that something bad begins to happen for an exploit or a network, you know, got data from the network or something like that, from, from the actual point in time where there's an exploit that successfully allowed penetration or access or something like that to the point of discovery is months. So I think that there's a potential for machine learning as we currently use it to be leveraged in lots of different points along that timeline to maybe minimize that and as well maybe to shorten that timeline for when you would end up discovering that something, something happened. But to reverse that all the way to the left and say, I want to discover the point in time when something might happen, predictive cybersecurity that is highly specific. Um, that's extremely difficult to, to, to tease out and, and currently takes, like I say, it, it, it takes you a month to figure out when it happened. And a lot of times when you do figure out when it happened, you can't exactly decide what it is that happened. You know, it started about here. It's kind of here. So I think it's really valuable. I think there's more work to be done before it can be really preventative. And I see there's a question there about bias. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. You can, yeah. If you could. Well, just hand, before take we finish, a... in, in, in 30 seconds, the the horse example was an example of bias. The data that was provided was not representative overall. It had a piece of it that that was not helpful or not representative of the data set. The the compass uh, on the on the one of the earlier slides, I was talking about the compass data set, where a data set perfectly good for uh, reducing recidivism for prisoners going, uh, prisoners getting out and going back to jail was is being used universally kind of now to decide who goes to jail and for how long. So the bias of people are already in jail and using that to decide on people that may not have had any interactions 
there's a bias present in that algorithm that is used on that data set because the data set isn't representative of the true problem. So if the data doesn't represent the true problem, you can't get the right answer. It'll give you an answer, but it won't be the right answer. I, I don't know if that helps, but uh, that's a little bit about some of the bias concepts. Okay. Thanks for thanks for giving us your take on that. Sure. Um, we don't, you know, there, if anybody has any other questions, uh, like I said, you know, hit 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 uh, Michael up here while you have the opportunity. Uh, but um, I kind of I've kind of gone through my list of questions, Michael. But I guess the kind of one thing I'm curious about is, you know, I mentioned as I was doing your introduction, you know, that you you did this. Uh, machine learning boot camp at, for the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory, the Information Directorate. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, uh, you know, you know how, how that went? What was your experience? How, what, what do you, you know, how did the students like it? If you, you know, just had a couple minutes and, uh, you know, had, had anything you'd like well, to share if, about that, I'd be... If, if, if folks are bored and want to go on other things, that's fine, but I can talk for a couple of minutes about that because it was quite exciting, and it was a pilot program. This was the first instance, and I had had folks for about three months or so, um, and I tried to go through some of the foundational ideas and get them to the point where they could be using machine learning to solve a problem of their own design, uh, selected design. Um, it was a lot of hard work. My observation is that there's still a, a, a human reticence about letting go and letting the data tell them about itself versus arbitrating and explicitly saying, I want the data to tell me this, and I'm going to make it tell me this by doing this thing, versus I'm going to ponder what could happen and find an algorithm that will do this back and forth re uh, uh, error correction over time to give me better answers and let it learn and tell me what it tell me what the answer is versus versus do it uh, up front and it's very difficult for people to do that to let go and actually do machine learning in a fashion where they approach the data in a way that allows them to build an algorithm and get a result out and not flavor it by their own activities or cheat and look at the data and say, well, I think I'd better use this set of data versus that one. It's it's the personal uh, reticence to let things go and let the machine learning work is, is one of the takeaways for me. But overall, it was great. It was a very widely, uh, the, 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 the cohort had lots of different skills, and I'm hoping, I think that most of them got some reasonable things out of it, but everybody learns from where they start. So uh, part of the learning curve for me is trying to figure out how to maneuver the curricular ideas and the boot camp aspect of it for people to dig on their own at a level that they can start digging and then make their own hole. And and uh, the other thing I wanted to check on, so it wasn't wasn't like just kind of one particular group, uh, correct? I mean, this was... This was like engineers working across the lab in all the different domains, right? It wasn't so it wasn't just focused on one particular area. Oh, no. This was, was, was across the direct. Across, yeah, 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 yeah. There were there were younger folk and older folk and uh, kind of folks leaning on the management side and kind of folks leaning on the research side. It, it was it was pretty diverse. Civilians, military. Um, it was a great group, and and they did they did amazing things for the amount of time. They invested a lot of time and effort, but I did get feedback from some of the senior people at the lab that were very, very impressed with the amount of thought and work that went into the final project. It, it was a boot camp, project-based, so it had a learning component and a doing component, and the doing component, uh, that's that's where they got a chance to dig in and do some things, and it, I think it helped, but we'll, we'll see. Over time. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the uh, you know kind of the experience, experiential learning, the hands-on, you know, the hands-on doing. I think that's I think that's really key in in helping folks, uh, you know, grasp grasp something and and you know be able to apply it and take it to the next level. So. Sure. And, um, and that's the art of it. Yep. 
Okay, and so uh, you know, I think we're uh, you know we've 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 passed the uh, one o'clock. Uh, we've yeah, I, passed I the one o'clock hour. Oh no, 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 no problem. No, no, no. Like I said, this was uh, this was uh, uh, you know very very informative. Like I said, it's a you know an area where you get you know some very extreme you know dissenting views on you know what you know what machine learning is, and I think this was very. Um, you know, beneficial in helping us bound it, understand it, and, and, you know, figure out what it is and what we can do with it. So I, mm-hmm. you know, thank you for taking the time to share, share this with us and, uh, you know, congratulate you on the, on the work you did with the, uh, with those young engineers on that boot camp. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to seeing the great things that they do with that. Well, I appreciate everybody's time and attention. So thanks. I, I, I had a lot of fun. I hope you got something out of it. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And uh, right. thank everybody for, for joining us. And uh, we'll uh, hope to see you uh, at our uh, uh, next next webinar in uh, March. And uh, we'll hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye now.